Uh, for those of you who know me, and some of you do, um, I may be a priest, but my passion, without having gotten a degree, is history. And I particularly love U.S. history, and it's for a number of reasons. Um, of course, being a priest, my life is my faith, and teaching that faith. And when I was in the seminary, someone asked me, Father Bill, not Father, it's Bill, when you're ordained a priest, what do you want your cause to be? And I'm sure they were thinking things like pro-life. I hadn't really thought of it, but without missing a beat, I just said Catholic patriotism. I am proud to be a Catholic. I wouldn't be anything else, despite everything we've been hearing going on. I'm not going to abandon the church to that. But also, I am also a patriotic American. I am very proud of the history that we have in this country. And so, the presentation I want to give tonight, in light of what we see in the news, especially with certain factions in our country wanting to push religion out of the public square, saying that that is among the foundational principles of America is pushing religion out, in my studies of U.S. history and the Constitution and the founding documents um, and reading the biographies of virtually all the presidents, um, I thought I'd put together a presentation from a compilation of that, other presentations that I have gone to, uh, which I've entitled God and Country, and is basically a presentation on the religious references we see in the founding documents of the United States. I'm limiting it to that. I know like the Massachusetts Bay Charter spoke of religion and some of the other colonies spoke of religion, but I'm confining it to just the founding documents of the United States. But uh, before I begin, um, people have commented me on the, uh, the jacket. Uh, university series has been started up in Marin County in the Archdiocese of San Francisco. I gave the inaugural talk and um, <laughs> They heard I had spoken extensively in the five years I was down here, and they wanted me involved. And so, of course, Father Heaney had given me this, and I wore it, and it impressed them. And so, okay, now I've worn it, you see it, the advertisement is done, so I thought I'd just put on something a little more appropriate. <laughs> Let us now stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. No, just stay, stay seated, stay seated. Um, let me see if I can get myself sounding a little better here. Okay. When I don't have note cards or anything, I can just turn the pages, then I can hold the microphone a little better. Before I get into the United States, the whole idea of a, of a democracy in a democratic society, or in our society, a democratic republic, it's not a pure democracy, but a democratic republic, the Founding Fathers, of course, looked back to ancient democracies and ancient republics to see the pluses and the minuses and everything about them, including the cultural aspects that were brought forth. But going all the way back to one of the original ancient democracies of Athens, I want to talk about, whoops, I went backwards there, hit the wrong button. There we go, we're going forward. I want to go back to Socrates, uh, who, as we all know, is the ancient Greek philosopher from Athens, who was considered a bad influence on the youth, so he eventually had to commit suicide. He lived circa 470, 469, up to 399 BC, and he died at Athens at 71 years of age. He was forced to drink uh, hemlock and uh, kill himself. But his influence still is felt in philosophical circles today. Socrates was very critical of democracy, saying that not everyone should participate in it that education is essential to the participation in a democratic system. And I'm sure if you've ever talked to voters nowadays, you might agree with him. <laughs> you know, free cell phones and I'll, I'll vote for this particular person. And he had a good point. He didn't think everyone in the society should have the privilege of participating in a democracy, that education was essential. However, what we also see in the revolution that led to the Constitution of the United States and our democratic republic we see that there's another element that our founding fathers at least implicitly recognized as an important element to the formation of an ongoing democratic society, a democratic republic, and that, believe it or not, is the presence of religion. A number of the founding fathers did speak of the importance of religion to be protected in our nation. And so when people are saying that it is 
more foundationally American that religion should be kept out of the sphere, of the public sphere, that is not entirely accurate because what I'll show you in the founding documents is that they at least implicitly valued the presence of faith. Uh, because if we, there is no God, then there really is no universal principles. Let me give you an extreme example. If there is no God, then the Holocaust is merely something I don't like, and which majority opinion doesn't like. But majority opinion could change over time, and we see some people's opinion have changed about it recently. But with an, a God, we can say the Holocaust is evil because of an overarching truth of good and evil, virtue and vice that is good for a society and the world. Without religion, we can perhaps see various divergences from the principles of a, of a nation that is being founded. And I like to show as an example a comparison from two principal revolutions from the age of revolution, and that is the American Revolution and the French Revolution, which occurred close to the same periods. The French Revolution came just a couple of decades after the American Revolution. Now, Jesus did have a great saying, by their fruits, you will know them. So let's take a look at the fruits of the French Revolution and the American Revolution. And this is just an overview, not an inconcise view, uh, review of it. One big principle is that both of these revolutions were started on and built upon enlightenment principles, principles of the enlightenment. However, the French Revolution was built upon atheistic enlightenment principles, and perhaps understandably so. One of the three estates that the third estate wanted to overcome was the other two were the nobility and royalty and the church, and the largest of the estates were the commoners. They were the ones who conducted and brought about the revolution, and they wanted to overcome the other two and wanted to take religion and the church out of everything. The United States, on the other hand, was built upon enlightenment principles that at least acknowledged a supreme being to which we owe our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, and our rights. So what's the difference? The, by, the, by their fruits you will know them. Let's just take a look at a few features, a few fruits of both revolutions. The French Revolution gave us Robespierre. The American Revolution gave us Thomas Jefferson. You be the judge. <laughs> Were either men perfect? No. But which would you have rather had? The French Revolution gave us Napoleon. The American Revolution gave us George Washington. How did we get so lucky? You be the judge, which would you rather have? And Washington did have the temptation to remain on as a military king. But not only after the revolution did he lay down his sword, but after his two terms as president, he laid down his power. Both revolutions involved a war. There was the Revolutionary War of the American Revolution and the Border War of the French Revolution. And both of those wars produced these, some would say, both great leaders. But you had the emperor and dictator Napoleon, and you had President George Washington. Finally, the French Revolution concluded with a great terror that consumed the very fathers of the revolution, including Robespierre and Marat and others like them. Whereas the American Revolution, when the first form of government under the Articles of Confederation didn't work out, resulted in the Constitutional Convention, which is still influencing our country and the world today. We're still debating it, we're still discussing it, we're still delving into the values and virtues of, of self-governing that it espoused, even if we didn't do it perfectly from the outset. I always love, let me just do a bit of a side, um, just in case you're thinking of it, I'm about to make fun of you. Every now and again, because we'll, I, I just mentioned Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, and they say, Father, didn't they own slaves? Yes, they did, get over it. <laughs> it's been two thirds of our nation's history we've been re without it, all right? However, in their writings, and this isn't on slavery, this talk isn't on slavery, in their writings close to the end of their lives, they kind of reflected a sentiment that, well, in light of what this nation's been found on, it isn't exactly you know, kosher to have the institution of slavery. 
Now, Jefferson never did free his slaves, and, and, but you saw in their writings, they were beginning to, to really question the appropriateness of slavery in the society that they had founded. So you did see them begin to develop their opinions, evolve in their opinions. And of course, even the Constitution put in safeguards that would, uh, and, and uh, abolitionist points that would lead to the ultimate abolition of slavery. So these wasn't a bunch of white racist slave owners. They did put things in the Constitution to eventually lead to the ultimate abolition of slavery, and, and, and we know that story. But when we look at the two revolutions of the French and, um, and the uh, American, both yielded good things, but right now we are on our second government system that started in 1791. France is on its sixth, I think or at least their fourth by the end of the 1800s. They even brought back the monarchy for a time and then decided they still didn't want it anymore. So you look at the fruits of both revolutions and you, and you see one big difference, among others, is that one was built on atheistic principles, the other was built on principles of faith, even though both of them were enlightenment principles. State religion, no but at least an acknowledgement of a higher power to which we owe a certain degree of gratitude for the things that we receive. And so from the very beginning, the issue of religion was important to the Founding Fathers, and there's a big difference that we see uh, in the various periods of our nation's history in terms of the approach of religion and how the government is to deal with it. And we speak of, in this country, freedom of religion. But prior to 1776, Government had the power to curb or forbid any practice or activity that was not in conformity with the religion approved by the government. So there was a state religion. How many here have ever been to Colonial Williamsburg? How many here have heard at least once or twice that it was compulsory to attend Episcopal Church on Sunday? And that was part of the law. That was the State Church of Virginia. So prior to 1776, the government could compel or forbid the practice of a particular state religion. Today, the understanding is that there's a demand that the government must intervene to forbid religious inclusion and influence in the public square. We certainly see that every time you turn around. Forget that the Ten Commandments was a major development of law. God gave it to Moses, so get it out, it's religious. Well, I wonder what religion Hammurabi was. But the Hammurabi Code is not among the things they want to get rid of, but because the Ten Commandments is so closely linked to religion, they want to get rid of it. But the Ten Commandments is one of the major, major milestones of the development of law in human history, which kind of gives us a little bit of a boost of an ego here, that our development of law is much more universal. It wasn't just for, at the time it was for the Jewish people, but it's de developed to be a more universal code of law that's influenced law uh, throughout history. However, at the nation's founding, the understanding was that government is to take no action to impose or forbid the practice of religion anywhere. In other words, the government is to stay completely out of it. No state religion but they're not to prevent the practice of religion anywhere. There's no classification of where. No state religion, but they were not going to hinder the freedom of the people to practice their faith in the way their conscience and their faith dictates. So you see a big difference between before the revolution, at the revolution, and the attitudes of today. Because for the Founding Fathers, the principle was religious liberty. And the religious liberty had two main elements. One is religious liberty itself. The second were still the limits and qualifications of that religious freedom. It was not an absolute, nor was it intended to be seen as an absolute. My religion calls for it, therefore I can do it. So for the, to the first point, we have the free exercise of religion as part of religious liberty. In addition to freedom of conscience, as that religion forms it, within us, and that all people are free to worship God, but also to follow God's laws as they believe it outside of church worship. That's one thing we're hearing a lot of, especially in the last presidential administration. They don't call it freedom of religion, they call it freedom of worship. 
and they say they believe in freedom of religion, but only in the church and in the privacy of the home. You've heard that, haven't you? But here, the principle is not only worshiping God, but following God's laws as we believe them outside the context of worship. But there are limits and qualifications, provided it does not disturb the public peace or impose upon the rights of other people. In other words, my religion might tell me to murder the infidel or to sacrifice children or to be married to multiple wives. The Mormons had to deal with that in their admission of Utah into the Union. Also, in principle, no exception to the laws of protecting a person and property. Some of you might remember a few years back, I think it was in Wyoming, but certainly within the cowboy belt, uh, a herd of buffalo, privately owned, gave birth to a white buffalo. So naturally, the Native Americans uh, you know, were very excited about it, and they were maintaining our religion considers that sacred, so we want to take that white buffalo from the owner for our use. And of course, the law said, no, it's the private property of someone else. You can purchase it if you like, but you don't have a right to it if it belongs, if it's someone else's private property. So there are limitations to um, freedom of religion, and rightly so. And this was also expressed in a letter to the annual meeting of Quakers by George Washington in September of 1789. And in the letter, as I am just quoting a portion of it here, it says, it is doing the people called Quakers no more than justice to say that, except they're declining to share with others the burden of the common defense, there is no denomination among us who are more exemplary and useful citizens. So he's not saying force them to enter the military, but he's expressing a certain annoyance with the Quakers. He sees their value in their contribution to society as a deeply religious people. However, we all got to contribute to the defense of this country if it's going to survive, and they don't want to do it. So he's kind of like, an, it's an, a minor annoyance for George Washington. And there's where he's saying, except they're declining to share with others the burden of the common defense. And why is that? Because Quakers are pacifists, absolute pacifists. Now, it doesn't say that Washington would want to force them to do it, but you are seeing at least expressed a minor annoyance that they won't do that. So religious liberty is never a sense of being entitled, but it is still a... Uh, not, not, religious liberty is not absolute in all things, but it still is a very valued principle in the founding of this country. To the point that the Founding Fathers, while they did not want a state religion or state church, also did not want an atheistic society. And shortly after the Revolution, they were proved right when you saw what happened with the French Revolution and what happened on the outskirts. Out Even in the French Revolution, Robespierre tried to create a religion of the supreme being because he saw a void was being filled by violence. And he began to recognize, without religion, something destructive is going to fill that void. Now, what was the nation founded upon? The first of the founding documents was the Declaration of Independence. I keep hitting the wrong button and going backwards. The first was the Declaration of Independence. And the, ba the basic outline of the Declaration I have on the board in a moment, uh, it has basically six parts. The first part is the preamble of the, I'm not talking the preamble of the Constitution, but there is a preamble statement in the Declaration of Independence. The second part is the statement of principles. These are the principles whereupon we are declaring independence. The third is a statements, statements of the grievances against King George II, their accusations on how he has behaved toward the colonies that compel them to separate. Part four, they acknowledge past efforts to address these grievances that came to nothing. Part five, they also call, they also talk about past calls for justice and consanguinity, until in the end, part six, they make their final declaration. Now, about a hundred years ago, we had a president named Woodrow Wilson, and in one talk, he was among the early leaders to assert the fact that the Constitution is an ancient document that can be outdated over time. And his illustration of that was that if you took out the beginning and the end of the Constitution, 
what do you, uh, the Declaration of Independence, what do you have? All you have is a list of grievances. It says, take out the beginning and the end of the, of the Declaration. It's nothing more than just a list of grievances against a king and a nation and an empire that has long since dissolved. So it's not relevant anymore. I would agree with him. I would agree with Woodrow Wilson on that. With one extra proviso. You take out the beginning and the end, it's a list of grievances. But if you take out the list of grievances, what are you left with? The heart and soul of what our country was founded on. And you can put in whatever grievances you want at any time or place. So I would say it isn't an ancient document that can become outdated. The grievances, yes, but certainly not the principles on which the nation was founded. And so, it is from these three points that I'm going to give you quotations and point out the interesting elements of the, this part of the Declaration of Independence uh, that is conducive to the theme of this talk. So here we are, I'm gonna take a deep breath. It's one great long run-on sentence. <laughs> when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So what is it saying? When independence is necessary, prudence demands we tell you why. That's basically what <laughs> this long run-on sentence is saying. So it opens up by saying, we're going to declare and we're going to tell you why. But what is interwoven in this particular statement? When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. What's at the heart of this? to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. They are implicitly acknowledging that there is a divine element in the reasons that they are citing to separate from England. And they are acknowledging the presence, if not involvement, of faith in a higher divine being. Maybe not a particular church, but faith in a supreme being whose principles compel them to this separation. The second part is the statement of principles, which begins with the line, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Now, let me ask the question. You can participate as you can. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What truths? Anyone? All men are created equal. What else? With certain inalienable rights, what else? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do we remember anything else? That's usually where people stop. Right. The word, the operative word of this sentence is that. Okay? We hold these truths to be self-evident. Whoops, I hit the wrong button again. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights given to us by God, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. One more. That Whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, what is it? The protection of the rights given to us by God. It is the right of the people bestowed by their creator. It is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. It is the right, we have, all men are created equal, 
They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, of what, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and to replace the government if it fails to protect those rights given to us by God, which we do in every election. If anyone doesn't think the last presidential election was somewhat, well, maybe revolutionary, <laughs> and yet we did it without a shot being fired. I actually had the privilege of being at the inauguration of President Trump. After that election, I wasn't gonna miss it for the world. <laughs> and I was really moved by the fact that you had two people so radically different as Barack Obama and Donald Trump, and they're engaged, aside from the shouting of a few protesters, the peaceful transfer of power at 12 o'clock on January 20th, on that day. I got a bit verklempt, by the way. It was really something to see, and it was one of the most exciting days of my life. And yet, we're exercising our rights given by God to alter the government if we feel it's not securing those rights given to us by God. So what's the hierarchy here? There's God giving the people rights, and the government is of the service of the people to protect the rights given by God. Tell me that's an atheistic principle. It's not. So just in those first two paragraphs, what compels them is nature and nature's God. The values of nature and nature's God. And one of the basic principles is that we have certain rights that cannot be taken away because they're not given to us by government. They're given to us by God. Say that to a few people today. It's government who gives us the rights. Grant us these rights. And we throw rights on everything. I, I like chocolate chip cookies, so I have a right to chocolate chip cookies. We throw rights to anything we want these days. But with these men, a right is directly connected to what God has bestowed upon us as human beings. It is from this springboard that they go into the list of grievances that they had against King George III and England. But by the end of the Declaration, we have now the formal Declaration of Independence, in which they declare, we therefore, there we are, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states. So now they're making that moment, the declaration. Here's, a, here's the statement, or here's the statement of principles, here are the grievances, and here are the efforts we had to try and solve the problem, and therefore, we are now declaring independence. But what, again, is interwoven into that statement? Appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. Let him judge our intentions. Appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right to be free and independent states. Another run-on sentence, and it's not done. See, it's the dot, dot, dot at the end. The sentence not done yet. But the very declaration of independence, the moment of declaration, they are again calling upon the um, supreme judge of the world to judge our actions. That's how confident they are in the rightness of their cause. And if they're wrong, God will judge them. So there's an acknowledgement of that faith and in the presence of a supreme being. And it concludes, for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The very last sentence twice mentions the supreme judge of the world and with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. So what do we have in the Declaration of Independence? The parts that Woodrow Wilson wanted to remove, we have the preamble, which states the laws of nature and of nature's God. The statement of principles endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. And the final Declaration of Independence, appealing to the supreme judge of the world with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Four times in the Declaration of Independence is a reference to God. Tell me that this is not 
a faith-based document. It's political and it's legal, but it's not atheistic. It's not declaring a state church, but it certainly is calling upon the virtue of recognizing a supreme being. Because without a supreme being, we're just doing this because we don't like you and we want to be independent. But here it puts weight to the justness of their cause. And we see that as a big difference from the other revolution, which conventional wisdom nowadays will tell you the French Revolution is the superior revolution of the two. I would beg to differ strongly on that. So that's the Declaration of Independence. The first form of government they put together after the revolution, uh, the war was concluded, was the Articles of Confederation. And the Congress, under the Articles of Confederation, put together what's called the Northwest Ordinance. It was an act of Congress enacted in July 13, 1787, passed by the Congress under the Articles of Confederation. And it created what is called the Northwest Territory, which is uh, the first territory organized in the United States. It consisted of the lands beyond the Appalachian Mountains, between British Canada and the Great Lakes to the north and the Ohio River to the south. Can you picture that now? Should I read it again? Beyond the Appalachian Mountains, between British Canada and the Great Lakes to the north and the Ohio River to the south. Can you picture it yet? Well, how about if that helps? <laughs> that is the Northwest Territory. And again, in, our, in terms of our recent history, you see the importance of that territory in the last election, the last presidential election. We have Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and Indiana. Also, Illinois and parts of Minnesota consist of the Northwest Territory. And this is the first territory acquired by the independent United States. Eventually, it would also acquire the Louisiana Purchase, uh, California, the Gadsden Purchase, Seward's Icebox, and Hawaii, other territories. But this was the first. And so how do they organize this? What policies did they develop to organize this? It established a precedent by which the federal government would be sovereign and eventually expand westward and organize other territories it would acquire. I'm not going to obviously read the entire Northwest Ordinance. But Section 13, this is an act of Congress, reads, and for the extending of the fundamental principles of civil and religious liberty. Not civil liberty. We have the American Civil Liberties Union, but do we have the American Religious Liberties Union? I might have something there, folks. <laughs> the fundamental principles of civil and religious liberty, which form the basis whereon these republics, their laws and constitutions are erected. In other words, religious principles are acknowledged to be a basis upon which these republics are organized. To fix and establish those principles as, as the basis of all laws, constitutions, and governments, which forever hereafter shall be formed in the said territory. To provide also for the establishment of states and permanent government therein, and for their admission to a share in the federal councils on an equal footing with the original states, at as early periods as may be consistent with the general interest. So what is that saying? It's acknowledging religion as a fundamental basis to the forming of a society and the laws whereby these territories will be governed that are consistent with the original states. So it's acknowledging that as part of the original states and the principles whereby these new territories will be governed. Is it saying a state religion? No. But it values religious principles, moral principles, as a foundation of these laws. It goes on, Article 1. No person demeaning himself in a peaceable and orderly manner shall ever be molested on account of his mode of worship or religious sentiments in the said territory. So what is that expressing? Again, freedom of religion. So providing that they are not causing any real problems, <laughs> demeaning themselves in a peaceable and orderly manner will not be bothered because of their religious faith. Easier said than done in the early years of, of the uh, of the nation, but those principles were a foundation to the organization of the country. In Article 3, it says, religion, now note the order in which these are named, religion, morality, and knowledge, necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Note it does not say churches, 
But schools and the means of education will be the means whereby religion, morality, and knowledge are passed on and taught. So here's the first organized territory acquired by the United States, and in the Northwest Ordinance, they're acknowledging religion and morality as an important basis for the formation of government and the settlement of these territories. Why? Because that's how we keep ourselves in check. We don't say thou shalt not kill because we just don't like killing. We say thou shalt not kill because God said it. How many have read the book of Leviticus? I love the book of Leviticus. It's boring, but at the end of every article of law, he repeats the first part of the first commandment. What's the first part of the first commandment? I am the Lord your God, and you're not. (laughs) That's not in that part as well, but I am the Lord. This shall be the law, and this shall be your practice. I am the Lord your God. This shall be the law, this shall be the practice. I am the Lord your God. It's repeated constantly. Why are we doing this? Who the heck does he think he is to tell us what to do? I am the Lord your God. That's who I think I am. And it keeps us morally in check so that without it, we see life descending into anarchy. Of course, the uh, Articles of Confederation were less than successful in organizing a central government and uniting all the states together and especially providing for its defense and other means of taxation. So the Constitutional Convention was formed to make amendments to the Articles of Confederation and ended up writing a whole new constitution. And George Washington was called out of retirement to preside over the uh, Constitutional Convention and um, the founding fathers, not this necessarily the same ones for the Declaration. For example, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams were ambassadors in Europe, in France at the time. They were not present for the forming of the Constitution. But George Washington, Benjamin Franklin were among those who were. And all the men of the Founding Fathers, whether it's for the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, were men of different degrees of religiosity and religious faith. Some were atheists, some were deists. One was Catholic. Benjamin Franklin, if it was practical, he was for it. So he he believed in God, but for practical purposes. So all of them were religious to varying degrees, but they all agreed on the importance of religion, so much so that to help coax states into ratifying the Constitution, they passed the first 10 amendments, which came to be known as the Bill of Rights. And the first amendment of the United States Constitution, hopefully we know, states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That's a mouthful for the First Amendment. But we call it the first freedom, and the first freedom is not freedom of speech, it's freedom of religion. Now, is this amendment a limit on what the people can do? No. This is a limit on what the government can do. It doesn't say the people cannot practice their religion in the public square if it's religious. It says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So what should be our response when they tell us you can't have a Christmas crib on public property? I can think of a few words, but let me give you the most G-rated one. We didn't ask you. Stay out of it. I always wonder, when the Civil, American Civil Liberties Union takes people to court for religious questions, why do we even show up? What are they going to do, fine us? Maybe, just don't pay it. How many have ever seen Gandhi? Remember that scene? Okay, I'll just, pay you, I'll just fine you five pounds. I won't pay five pounds. Put me in jail. I wish we had more people do that today, asserting their rights to practice religion. Granted, if they want to put an idol to the giant spaghetti monster, okay, let them look like a bunch of fools. And yeah, maybe some people want to put a satanic statue there, but okay, let's take them to court, let them demonstrate that this is a legitimate, well-established religion. No, it's something they came up with to combat us because they didn't like us. Let's use our imaginations, folks. But what we see in this is Congress shall make no law. 
respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now let's apply some of the more modern current principles of this amendment to the other parts of this amendment. Now what did we hear a lot, especially during the last presidential administration? I believe in freedom of religion, but only in the privacy of the home and the church. Now let's apply that to the other freedoms of this amendment. Why stop with just the first one? I believe in freedom of speech, but only in the privacy of the home and the church. And some people agree with that. We call it, what do we call it? Political correctness? Just as long as no one finds out about it 20 years later. <laughs> They'll love this one. I believe in the freedom of the press, but only in the privacy of the home and in the context of the church. <laughs> but you notice how quick, I mean, you know, whether you love him or not, when Donald Trump chastises, what's his name, from CNN, and bars him from uh, uh, Jim... Jim Acosta. I love it when those two spar. I'm just like, come on, let's get ready to rumble. But um, he bars Jim Acosta, and what do they scream? Freedom of the press, freedom of the press. Well, there are other reporters and other newspapers there. He's not barring the press, just that particular uh, reporter. And you notice how quickly they all come to one another's defense when it comes to freedom of the press. But how often does anyone come as diligently to defend the freedom of religion? which, by the way, comes not only before freedom of the press, but two freedoms before the freedom of the press. The right for the people to peaceably assemble, except in the church and in the privacy of the home. Only in the church and the privacy of the home. Or to petition the government for a redress of grievances, but you can only petition it in the context of the church and the privacy of the home. Why do we allow them to do that to the freedom of religion? And why are we so reluctant to assert our freedom of religion? when we don't apply it to any of the other freedoms. Now let's look at it another way. The whole thing in the context of freedom of religion. They love this one. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech so that we can preach that religion, or, the, or of the press, so that we can write about our faith and publicize it and promote it. Or the right of the people to peaceably assemble, to proclaim the value of that religion, such as a pro-life protest or an abolitionist movement, which are at the heart religious movements. Or to petition the government for a redress of grievances to see that our society conforms to religious morals and principles so that we can be more and more just society. We didn't force everybody to be Christian, but we sure rammed abolition down their throat whether they wanted it or not. And certain senators, like one from New Hampshire, named Franklin Pierce, who eventually became President of the United States and ran on a principle of hope and change, they liked him because he was an eloquent young senator, we've never heard that before, from the floor of the Senate at one time declared the abolitionists to be violators of the Constitution because they're trying to push their religious principles on the rest of us by declaring that slaves were equal dignity with whites and that slavery was immoral. Well, we sure showed him, didn't we? <laughs> and so nothing new is under the sun. I think there's a book in the Bible that talks about that. So when it comes to other issues today in which people of a religious basis are pushing for real change and evolution of values in this country are based in the churches. Abolition was a Christian movement. The civil rights movement had its foundation in the churches. The pro-life movement and the protection of marriage have their basis in the churches. Who are the ones who want to ignore those are the atheists or people for whom religion is little more than wishful thinking and imaginary friends. But the First Amendment is a limit of the government, and from that we have freedom of religion. We are free to practice it without being hindered in any way, shape, matter, or form by the government. And it's not freedom from religion, it is freedom of religion. And so, religious liberty must be protected by two means, the means of the national defense, which is the responsibility of the federal government, and by criminal laws, 
which are the responsibility of the states to protect the religious freedoms of their citizens. Not to hinder homeschoolers who want to promote their own value system and force kids to go to a secular progressive public school system where they're learning little more about morality other than how to use birth control, for, of which people religiously object. You can tell I can get myself fired up on some of these things. But again, there are many things we can hold on to in terms of religious principles if we're willing to assert that. Because again, the United States founding fathers valued faith and religion as a foundational principle, even if they didn't want to have a state religion. So following the Constitution, I want to um, go over a couple of the um, words of the founding fathers that we see in their writings. And just two mainly. Uh, one is um, how the government, both of them on how the government should be in support of religion. Not endorsing a state church, but, it, uh, but be supportive of the actions of religion. And George Washington, in his letter to the annual meeting of the Quakers, which I quoted earlier, uh, quite eloquently and quite detailed, and hopefully I can read it. In my notes, it's a small print. He states, government being instituted to protect the persons and consciences of men and oppression, of men from oppression, it certainly is the duty of rulers not only to abstain from it, oppression, themselves, but according to their stations to prevent it, oppression, in others. He goes on. The liberty enjoyed by the people of these states of worshiping Almighty God is not only among the choicest of their blessings, but also of their rights. While men perform their social duties faithfully, they do all that society or the state can with pro propriety demand or expect, and remain responsible only to their maker for their religion or modes of faith, which they may prefer or profess. I assure you very explicitly that in my opinion, the conscientious scruples of all men should be treated with great delicacy and tenderness, and it is my wish and desire that the laws may always be as extensively accommodated to them as due regard to the protection and essential interests of the nation may justify and permit. He's saying the laws, insofar as it, it, it can be done uh, legitimately within the state, should protect, accommodate, and respect people's religious views. Now again, if their religious views say that you know, they want to sacrifice their kid to the gods, obviously that is not something that would be allowed. There are still the limits. But so long as they act peaceably, government should be in support of religious practice and the contributions of religion to society, such as work with the poor, education, hospitals, so on. And that is George Washington in his letter to the annual meeting of the Quakers in September 1787. The next one puts into context a very important concept we hear thrown around all the time. And that is of Thomas Jefferson in his letter to the Danbury Baptist Church on January 1st, 1802. Pay close attention to the context in which all this is stated. The affectionate sentiments of esteem and appro approbation which you are so good as to express towards me on behalf of the Danbury Baptist Association, give me the highest satisfaction. My duties dictate a faithful and zealous pursuit of the interests of my constituents, and in proportion as they are persuaded of my fidelity to those duties, the discharge of them becomes more and more pleasing. Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legislative powers of government which at reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declare that their legislature should, quote, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Adhering to, this built, adhering to this expression of the supreme will of the nation in behalf of the rights of conscience, 
I shall see with sincere satisfaction the protection of those sentiments which tend to restore to man all his natural rights, convinced he has no natural right in opposition to his social duties. So there's the limit, the social duties. But here's where we have for the first time the reference to separation of church and state and what is the context in which he is saying it. Seeing how important conscience and religion is, I rejoice in the part of the Constitution that limits government and prohibits them from interfering with it, thus forming a wall separating the church from the state. In other words, my friends, separation of church and state admits that government has an interest in supporting religious opinion. Separation of church and state is a protection for the church from the state, not of the state from the church. When you look at the context in which that, point was, that phrase was originally coined, shall I go back and read it again? <laughs> Slowly. Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legislative powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declare that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Tell me in there where it says the church must stay out of state matters or religion must stay out of state matters. This is very explicitly meaning the state must stay out of church matters. But people of faith can certainly have that faith inform how they live, how they vote, how they govern. As long as they aren't telling the people you have to be Anglican, you have to be Catholic, you have to be Muslim, you have to be Jewish, you have to be, throw in whatever other religion there. Thomas Jefferson saw it as paramount, and he was an agnostic. He wrote a book on the life of Christ, which took out all the miracles, to emphasize Christ as just a great teacher and great leader. He just didn't have that as part of his faith, but he and the other founding fathers saw the value of religion to a society that needed to be protected from the government. So again, when a government, like a judge, tells you you have to take down the Ten Commandments from your courtroom, judge, who was the one in Alabama? Erwin Moore. What's the proper response to the judge? I can think of a few. Let me give you the G-rated version of it. Come bring them down yourself. How many of you have ever been to the Congress? And the Supreme Court, upon the friezes above the Supreme Court, we have Moses. If you've been to the Library of Congress, one of the fields is theology, and the statue is Jesus on one side and Moses on the other. And so when we really look at the context of this in the founding, again, I'm not saying that the founding fathers wanted a state religion. And I'm sure if I had a different group in here, they probably would still be going into convulsion, saying, separation of church and state, separation of church and state, separation of church and state. But what is the context in which separation of church and state was coined? Not to protect the state from the church, but the church from the state. Finally, if you've ever been to the Jefferson Memorial, and on the four pillars that hold up the dome, in the interior of those pillars, you have quotations of documents and works of Thomas Jefferson and speeches. It ends, or it, it, one of them is, and I'll conclude, I think this is the, yep. It, it includes a portion of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which was written by Thomas Jefferson. Now, bear in mind, a few minutes ago I told you Virginia required people as a colony to attend Episcopalian Church. And now a son of Virginia and a founding father uh, wrote out the Statute for Religious Freedom. In fact, on his gravestone, if you've ever been to Monticello and saw the grave of Thomas Jefferson, nowhere on his grave does it say he was President of the United States. It says he was Governor of Virginia, author of the Declaration of Independence, and author of the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. But it doesn't say he was President of the United States. 
And he states, Almighty God hath created the mind free. All attempts to influence it by temporal punishments or burdens are a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion. No man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship or ministry, or shall otherwise suffer on account of his religious opinions or belief. But all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their religious opinions in matters of religion. I know but one code of morality for men, whether acting singly or collectively. And for him, that was absolute, with, per, with certain limitations for civic duties, freedom of religion in this country. And so, we see the Founding Fathers did not intend the government to be a biodome that leaves out religious principles. The ballot box is not an anti-religious biodome. We're not forcing our religion on other people. We're not forcing them to go to church. But as voters who have a faith and a morality by which we, lead, we live, should and in fact are obliged to vote our faith to contribute to the well-being of society from the standpoint of our principles to make them more standards of society. If other people don't agree with it, well, there were a number of people who did not agree with abolition. And in fact, that was a Christian movement. There were a number of people who did not agree with the civil rights movement, but that was at its heart, a Christian movement. And there are many people who don't agree with the pro-life movement and other movements to preserve traditional values and also preserve a certain degree of justice in society. But we unfortunately have become a society that's been intimidated by the phrase separation of church and state. And yet we shouldn't be, because we're voters and we're believers and we're entitled to have that say in society. And when they seek to use the government or even misquote the Constitution, just as the devil quoted God's word to tempt Jesus, They'll quote the Constitution to assert their atheistic agenda. We can certainly meet him halfway and say, we agree. The Founding Fathers did not want a state religion or a state church, but they definitely wanted a religious population because that is the only way in which a democratic republic can survive if we hold on to absolute truths that we are bound to as principles upon which we build our society and govern it now and in the future. So, thank you very much for your attention this evening. <laughs> All right, I guess we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, that the, the principles of freedom from religion uh, insist that the government insert itself to push religion out and at least in the public sphere, it's an atheistic society. There's where you just quote the, the First Amendment. Uh, I'm not aware of any specific cases, and this is where questions can be dangerous because it, sometimes it goes a little outside what I talked about, even if it may be relevant, because uh, there are many, many different cases there. And there's where, you know, again, some, some groups are very wary of what judges are being put in. And if you've noticed recently, we've had certain senators, such as the two senators from California, who in questioning uh, in the hearings of certain judges have wanted to assert the Knights of Columbus as a hate group, <laughs> reasons for which they should not. Um, you agree that it's a hate group? <laughs> no, you're wearing the Knights of Columbus, okay. And reason that, a, that certain judges should not be allowed to be judges because they belong to a hate group that believes in traditional marriage as a religious principle, and therefore you know, should not be judges. They forget that uh, Article 6, Clause 3 says no religious test must be administered to government officials. And that's another part of the Constitution that asserts the protection of one's religion. Uh, so there, you know, we just need more people to assert what the Constitution says, but you can see where they're starting to get a little worried about who's being appointed as judges. Because they don't want religion's freedom to be imposed. Because I want to live my own morality. Well, no one's stopping you. But don't impose your lack of morals on the rest of the people who want a certain standard in society. Any other questions? Yeah, and, it, and you, you do see a lot of groups taking the moral high ground on that and therefore asserting themselves on moral grounds against some of us who hold to ver various religious principles as well. But the thing one has to remember is we've, we've taken freedom of religion and changed it to freedom of worship. 
And freedom of worship confines it to just the church, which is where they want it. But we have freedom of religion, and we can live that religion as long as we aren't imposing on the rights of other people uh, and performing our civic duties. Uh, you know, that the government can't assert itself. And I always love the fact that both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson are among the founding fathers, not the only ones, who asserted that in their, in their uh, extra-constitutional writings. Even though those letters aren't necessarily um, legally binding, we get inside the head of the founding fathers in terms of the principles whereby they were going for it. Someone else had their hand up uh, around here? Is putting a crucifix or a cross on public property a violation of someone else's freedom of religion? Uh, well, if, it, if it's a local town and they, as a town, have decided to do that, again, Congress shall make no law. Now it says Congress, not necessarily the state governments or the local governments. You know, that would be an issue for the local government, I would say. I'm not a lawyer in that regard. But, okay, so you have a cross, you're in a predominantly Christian section. Is it a violation of my freedom of religion if I'm a, uh, an atheist? Now I'm speaking both as the atheist and the response to that atheist. I would say you don't have to look at the cross. You know, any more that I have to look at the ugly art on the side of a building, you know, hmm? and some of the billboards. And, uh, you know, there are some people who just can be offended by everything, but it's freedom of religion. If I'm saying I'm atheist and I don't want that because I'm not religious, well, it's freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. And I can't, at least if we go by the principles of the Constitution and separation of church and state, I can't petition the government to remove someone else's or a town, a free, anyone's free exercise of religion. And, um, you know, because it's not just the privacy of the home. It's how we live our lives. It's how we form our society. And that's just, again, that's just my two cents there. I might I could probably have someone who would disagree or, or, or explain it differently. So if it were that easy, we might see more lawyers fighting for this cause. When I comment on the practice of schools giving speeches or programs or anything mentioning God, um, I don't know about, you know, remember the Northwest Ordinance said that the religious and moral and civic formation schools are necessary. It didn't just say, didn't say churches. Um, I would say one has to be always respectful, but... Okay, this is my biased individual. Yeah, if you want to express a religious principle, if you're giving a speech or a class, okay. You're not forcing the other students to pray. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, fuss over like lunchtime uh, Bible groups. You don't have to join the lunchtime Bible group. But they're prohib prohibited from doing it because somehow it constitutes a forcing of religion on other people who really don't have to be there. That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, in other, you know, as we saw in, in the talk, government should be supportive of religious uh, upbringing and religious involvement. Um, where the line is drawn, it's just government cannot form a state church. But I would say it is perfectly constitutional and acceptable if a group of students at lunch want to form a Bible study group that isn't imposing itself on other students or on the class time for everyone else. Should they be learning more about Islam and ancient Buddhism and Hinduism as opposed to the contributions of Christianity to Western civilization that eventually led to the foundation of this country? No, they should learn that in, in class. Um, but in terms of imposing a faith, we're all now going to have a prayer, maybe, maybe okay, a moment of silence, but you know, again, I leave that to the, to the philosophers and the lawyers of debating that, but right now the push seems to be take everything religious out. And that certainly isn't what the Founding Fathers, uh, as I understand them, uh, intended. In terms of the schools, you know, no one's forcing you to be religious in the public schools, even if you are making a religious reference. That makes sense? Anything else? You're talking about the Johnson Amendment, which President Trump said he would work to overturn, and I'm still waiting. But he's got a while. Um, I think that is a hindrance of freedom of religion and freedom of speech. You know, one might say, I don't like this law. I want it to be changed. Once they ask why you don't like it, if I say because I'm a Catholic, say, ah, it's religious, you can't do it. Same thing with the question of abortion and marriage and abolition. We are Christian people, and this is our problem. It's Christian, we can't. And again, Franklin Pierce asserted that. So the idea that uh, they could be sued for asserting a religious uh, principle or inserting a religious uh, uh, presence or idealism into um, the government, 
the bishops have just as much of a say on, in the ballot box as the rest of us do, and they are our teachers. Uh, we priests, religious sisters, Catholics, Christians, as well as atheists and people of, of, of other religions or lack thereof, um, you know, bring the whole person into it, including our reasons for something. But I am not aware that the Johnson Amendment has ever, ever even been tested. I think it's one of those things where we as Catholic people, Christian people, have allowed ourselves to be bullied into silence because we don't want to run that risk. And, um, and of course, nowadays, I think everyone's afraid of a lawsuit for one reason or another, but, um, but also we do see a double standard. We probably would object if Donald Trump gave a campaign speech in a Catholic cathedral, but we had no problem with Hillary Clinton going to a Baptist church. It's just where are we going to assert ourselves? Where are we going to assert it? And it's, it's nothing to do with being one being Republican and the other being Democrat. It's just one was able to talk, speak in a church, and the other they'd raise an objection if he or she did. And so we just, you know, I, I find good people get weary very quickly. People who want to push contrary principles to faith don't weary, and they keep pushing it and want to wear us down. Um, how many people remember Mother Angelica? And she had that big statement that she made after I think someone played Jesus in Denver and that. I had heard of this speech a long time. I had never really heard it before. Then someone had it on YouTube and I watched it and at the end I thought, that's it? And what was her basic principle? What did she say? I'm tired. I'm so exhausted. And if I were on the other side trying to push it, I'd say, good, I'm wearing them down. We as people of faith need to stop uh, appealing to people's sympathies. No one cares if we're tired. We need to keep pushing it and so that our rights as uh, religious people, not that we're ramming our religion down your throat, but certainly, you know, the value of human life, the equality between the races. Uh, I always like to say Jesus did not suggest discipleship. He said, go and make them disciples. Now, again, that doesn't mean hang them from a sour apple tree if they don't become Christians, but there's nothing against us forming a society based on Christian principles. I like to say, I would agree, Jesus would say, I don't want you to, he doesn't want us to impose our views on other people. He wants us to ram it down their throats, whether they want it or not. <laughs> and an example of that I always love to give is abolition. Is abolition. A whole section of the country broke away because they didn't want to engage in that, and yet we made it a reality. The Christian churches did. I don't know how much the Catholic church was. I know the Archbishop of... Uh, Columbia, South Carolina, uh, was an ardent secessionist. I don't know if he was uh, um, pro-slave or, or abolition. But, um, but yeah, we, we, the Christians made it happen. It took a war, but they pushed the issue to the point that it became a reality in this country, even though the opposition said, well, that's a religious principle that you're forcing down our throats. And the same was done with the civil rights. We can do it again. But there, you know, we're not forcing a religion or a, a state church, but we can certainly impose or encourage and bring about a value system that we believe is most beneficial to the survival and future of our nation. Because those are the principles on which it was founded. Maybe not a religion, but certainly the existence of a supreme being who give us the rights that government serves to protect. And among those rights are the freedom of to profess that God who gives us the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So because of that, let me conclude at least with them. Um, I didn't last too long in the, in the Boy Scouts, but I always love the, uh, the Scout Oath from which I get the title of this talk. And it says, I promise on my honor to do my best, to do my duty, to God and my country, to obey the Scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. And if that, isn't bad for the, if that is a bad thing for this country, then we need to get back to the principles on which this country was founded. So again, we're getting close to the end. Thank you very much. <laughs>